In the last video, we posed the big question of frequentist inference. We can see what the data was and we can report an estimate, but how can we simulate all the ways that the data set might have turned out but didn't, so that we can measure how confident we should be? In this video, we'll look at one answer called parametric resampling. The idea is very simple. First thing we need is a probability model for the data. Of course we do. There's no way you can do any useful machine learning or inference at all without a probability model. We've looked at this climate data set in earlier videos, and this is the model we came up with. This is just one possible probability model for this data set, of course. It's not some absolute truth. Once we've stated a model like this, it's easy to see how to simulate the multiverse. The model tells us how to generate new values. Let's write it out more formally. Before simulating, actually, let's decide on a readout function, the thing we want to measure. In this climate example, the readout we're after is estimated rate of temperature increase. In other words, the maximum likelihood estimate for one of the parameters of our model. Next, we fit the model. In other words, we find maximum likelihood estimates for all of the model's parameters. And this is what lets us generate new synthetic data sets. We just sample from the probability model that we just fitted. Nothing could be simpler. Finally, we want to report the spread of our readout function. We'll just simulate lots, loads of synthetic data sets, evaluate the readout function on each of them, and, for example, plot a histogram. There's just one thing I want to stress here. Our readout function, let's call it t, has to be a function of the observed data, something you can compute given the data. It's not allowed to depend on unknown parameters. I'm stressing this because it's a common mistake I see in exam answers. You're asked to measure the uncertainty in a parameter estimate, you're rushed for time, and you don't need notice that your readout function depends on things that you don't know and that you can't compute. A readout function like this, something we can compute given the data in front of us, is called a statistic. Step three, look at the spread of readout values for our synthetic data set. Step three suggests plotting a histogram. Here's a histogram I got for possible values of the rate of temperature increase. Once you've got a histogram, you could stop there. Or what's common is to report a confidence interval. You could, for example, report a two-sided 95% confidence interval and say, here are two bounds, an upper and a lower, and I'm 95% certain that the estimated rate of temperature increase falls between these two bounds. There's a one-liner in NumPy for getting these bounds, numpy.quantile. There's nothing magic, though, about choosing the bounds with equal size tails, like I've done here. I could perfectly well ask for a one-sided confidence interval and say, I'm 95% certain that the estimated rate of temperature increase is less than this upper bound. It's up to you which confidence interval to report based on what your audience wants to know. OK, let's work through some examples. Pause the video and read the question. We'll start by working out what the maximum likelihood estimates are. The answers should be familiar to you from the very far first part of the course. Next, we just go through the three steps. It's exactly the same three steps every time. Step one, define the readout statistic. The question tells us we want a confidence interval for mu hat, so we'll define a function that takes in a data set and computes mu hat for that data set. Step two, Define a function for generating a random synthetic data set using the parameters from the fitted model. So I just compute sigma hat and then I generate a synthetic data set just like the original using my fitted parameters. Step three, sample the readout statistic by generating lots of synthetic data sets and computing the readout statistic on each of them. In my code snippets, I'm writing the list of sampled values with an underscore and I'm putting it in bold to emphasize that this is a list. Here, I'm also showing a two-sided 95% confidence interval. Okay, all done. Now for another example. This example will show us a really common pattern, turning an interesting question about your data set into a question about a model parameter. 
Here's the example. Pause the video and read the question. We're given two data sets, X and Y, and we want to know how similar they are. We're asked to model the X data set as drawn from normal of mu sigma squared and the Y data set as drawn from normal of nu sigma squared. And we can estimate the difference between the two data sets by the statistic nu hat minus mu hat. Actually, I said something wrong. I said we're given two data sets, X and Y. What I should have said is we are given a data set consisting of some X values and some Y values. When we do maximum likelihood estimation, we should always write it out in full as the likelihood of all of the data given all of the parameters. Here, the, all the data means all the X's and all the Y's, and all the parameters means all three of them, mu, nu, and sigma. I won't go through the process of fitting this because you've seen so many model fits already. Let's just look at the code. It's exactly the same three steps as before. First, define the readout statistic on line 5. This just implements the readout statistic that the question asked us to evaluate. Next, define a synthetic dataset generator, lines 10 to 12. Next, sample the readout statistic and plot a histogram if you like and find a 95% confidence interval as the question asks us to do. The only thing worth dwelling on here is the synthetic dataset generation. As always, when I say dataset, I mean all the data that we are given. Here we're given two collections of readings, X and Y, and so when we generate a synthetic dataset, we have to generate two collections of readings. The next example is a bit political. Here's a question about fires in the Amazon. In summer 2019, the news was full of stories about Bolsonaro and how, under his watch, the number of fires had dramatically increased. Here's a plot of the number of fires each year. The dataset contains day-by-day -day numbers for every year, but I'm only plotting the cumulative counts for each year up to 29th August to match the news article, which came out on 30th August. And, indeed, the 2019 figure is very high. It's more than twice as high as the preceding year. The question only asks us about 2019 compared to values since 2011. That's from reading the subtext behind this news article here. 2011 is when the previous president, Juma Hussefe, came to power, and the news article is implying a policy difference between her and Bolsonaro. So let's go ahead and answer this question with a confidence interval. First, we'll need a probability model for the data. When you're a data scientist, no one tells you the right probability model. You have to figure it out for yourself. And in fact, there's no such thing as the right model. All models are wrong, but some are useful. So let me offer not one, but two models. The first model is exactly the model we used in the previous example for looking at the difference between two groups. That's where you typically get probability models from. You build up a large repertoire of models by reading about the models that other people have proposed, and then you either copy them, or better yet, you take away from them the nifty features of their models so that you can mix and match them yourself. The question here asks us about the difference between 2019 and the years from 2011 to 2018, so I definitely need a model that's got enough parameters to express the idea 2019 is different. And I think there's a subtext in the question that says there's nothing much to distinguish the individual years between 2011 and 2018, so I'm not going to do so in my model. Of course, you are totally free to propose a different model. Now, have a look at model 2 on the right. This one's a bit different. It says that the values from 2011 to 2018 are sampled from normal of mu sigma squared, same as the left-hand model, but then it's got a different equation for the year 2019. It suggests normal of mu plus delta sigma squared, and then tells us to find a 95% confidence interval for delta hat. Actually, these models are exactly the same if you look at them in the right way. To see this, it might help to write them out as linear models, the sort of models we looked at in section 2 of the course. 
Here, I'm writing them the way we wrote linear models. I'm using bold symbols for vectors. The feature spaces for these two models are identical. The specific features they use are different, but in each case, the features span the same feature space. So the models express the same thing, just with different parameterization. So it doesn't actually matter which of the two models we use. We've already seen code for fitting model 1, so just for the sake of variety, I'm going to fit model 2. I'm going to write the code a bit more elegantly by thinking about what we're doing as a linear model. First, we need to know how to fit the model. I've written out the formula for mu hat and delta hat here, but you could perfectly well get them using sklearn.linear regression. And I've also written out the maximum likelihood for sigma. This formula here for sigma hat is generic. It applies to any linear model. We derived this formula earlier in the course. Next, we'll go through exactly the same three steps as before. The only thing that's slightly interesting about this code is the way I'm generating a synthetic data set. I'm doing it linear modeling style. I first fit the linear model, and this gives me predicted values for each of the years. And then I use these predicted values to generate the new synthetic data set. In the end, the 95% confidence interval turns out to contain zero. I am not confident that 2019 is different to 2011 through 2018. It's borderline, but not quite enough evidence for me to be confident. It is asking a lot to look for evidence for a policy change from a single number for a single year. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with it, it's just it would need a pretty extreme single number. If we had more numbers, we'd get a clearer picture, and it'd be good to rerun this analysis on up-to-date data. So, that is how we find confidence intervals for readout statistics. There are two things I want to note. There's nothing sacrosanct about the way we're reporting uncertainty. Here, we're reporting uncertainty using a confidence interval for an unknown parameter. In the next video, we're going to look at hypothesis testing, which is a different way to report uncertainty. Second, there's nothing sacrosanct about the way we're generating synthetic datasets. Any method for simulating the multiverse is a leap of faith. It has to be. How could we possibly deduce what might have happened when all we know is what did actually happen? In the following video, we're going to look at a different way to simulate the multiverse.